point there. All right. Good evening. The time is now uh, 5.01 on September 19th, and it's time to call the public safety meeting to order. Ms. Mihalich, will you please note attendance for the record? Okay, thank you all for attending. At this time, it does not appear as though there are any members of the public in the City Hall building or elsewhere. Um, council members, having reviewed the agenda, do you have any questions? I move to approve it as presented. Thank you. I will second that. Thank you. Yeah, um, as previously indicated, there does not appear to be any members of the public in attendance this evening. So we will go ahead and move on. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes dated September 6th of 2022. Are there any revisions or comments on the minutes? I have none. Okay. Uh, that being the case, is there a motion to approve the minutes dated September 6th? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. In that case, we can move on. There are no agenda bills uh, this evening. However, we do have a number of uh, great topics for discussion. So could we move on to wildland fires, please? You got there first, so you get to talk. I did, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing him a favor. Um, he's going to take the first part of it. I'm going to take the second part of it. Um, I thought with the Bull Creek fire and what was going on down in Packwood as of late, it would be uh, a good opportunity to kind of talk about how we would respond to a similar incident in this region. Um, so Mike's going to handle the response side of it, and then I will uh, handle the emergency management side of it, which is more talking about how we prepare your involvement in that as council members, um, et cetera. Okay. Evening. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about wildland. So what happens if there's a, a brush fire or a wildland fire here in Snoqualmie? First of all, just talk about definition, brush or wildland fire. Basically, they both mean a fire in a natural vegetation area. The public uses, uses them interchangeably, but really brush fire kind of refers more to a smaller fire, one that can be handled with a couple units or within it in one operational period where you usually hear wildfire used for the more large, wind-driven, uncontrollable fires, uh, they refer to a wildfire. But really, they're, you know, as far as the public goes, they're pretty much interchangeable. There's no real good definition between one or the other. So if there is one that happens in the region, uh, regionally, there are some resources that we do have uh, that I'll go through a little bit. So brush trucks, those are the types of, of rigs you'll see that will have a small pump on the back. Usually it's similar to like a pickup truck with a pump on the back of it can go back in the brush. So Redmond has two units. Bothell has one. Eastside Fire and Rescue has five. Uh, Fall City has one and Duval has one. Those are the, the ones that are in our zone. And again, our zone is from I-90 basically up around the east end of the lake uh, up to shoreline. Tenders are also used with wildland uh, responses. Fall City has one tender. Uh, Eastside has four tenders and Duval has one. Yes. Can you just explain what a tender is? Please? Tender would be the large fire truck that carries a large amount of water, whereas our regular fire engines only carry 500 gallons or so. The tenders carry up to, you know, 1,000, 2,000 gallons of water okay. or sorry, 10,000. Lots, a lot more water. <laughs> uh, and usually they're, ma they're mainly used for areas that don't have hydrants. Mm -hmm. Personnel wise, there, there's two really categories. There's a, a red carded personnel and non red carded. So a non red card would be somebody that's just a normal firefighter. They go on a brush response and they're allowed to work for pretty much the first hour of the response, but they're, they're limited in what they can do. They're really more considered an initial or quick attack. And they're usually tied to their fire engine as in amount of distance hose you can take off the fire engine usually as far as they like to go into the, the area. Red card personnel can perform an extended attack. They're more knowledgeable about the weather, the topography, the fire control as it pertains to wildland fires. They can work for extended periods. They're better equipped. Pretty much these are the, the SMEs or the subject matter experts when it comes to, to wildfire. So in Snoqualmie, currently there are six of our 10 personnel are wild card trained. Fall City has all of their personnel, which is 13. And Eastside has all of their personnel, which are red carded. 
there are some other departments around us, Bellevue, Redmond, Shoreline, they all have a, a smattering of, of red cards, but nobody is fully red card, red carded the same as like Fall City, East Side, and I forgot Duval, Duval also. We are kind of lucky here because we are surrounded by departments who are kind of considered big players in the wildland arena. Eastside Fire and Rescue and Duval are, are kind of the on the leading edge of the, the response in the area. So it is nice to have them around us in regards to resources and, and personnel overhead, like battalion chiefs and that, that are well versed in, in wildland activities. So if we do have a fire here in Snoqualmie or again in the area around us, just like some of our responses for, for structure fires, it's a tiered response. So based on how big it gets is what kind of units you're gonna get. So here, if we have a brush fire, which you know I would consider a pretty small brush fire, you're just gonna get two engines and a battalion chief. It's gonna roll off the table unless I stop it. There we go, okay. Two engines and a battalion chief. Talking. The second the alarm uh, is when it starts to get into a little bit bigger. That's where you're gonna get another engine two actual brush trucks, so wildland trucks, a tender, and another BC battalion chief. Third alarm, they add an engine, another brush truck, another tender, and then when it gets to fourth alarm, they add four engines and another brush truck. So as it gets bigger, they keep adding more resources. After that, you're gonna get resources from outside the area as a strike team where maybe Snohomish County or, or Pierce County would send us a strike team of like five brush trucks or whatever resource we need, brush trucks, tenders, those will be sent to us. Also, as the fire grows, the zone, the zone coordinator, uh, which I'm one of, there's three zone coordinators who kind of, when there's a large fire response, uh, whether it's wildland or structure fire, any kind of large response, they kind of monitor who's going where in the zone to make sure the right resources go there or backfill happens. So in a wildland instance, the, the zone coordinators, if we see that it's starting to get bigger, we'll actually call around to the other departments and kind of give them a heads up saying, hey, you're probably next up to get sent. You might want to get some of your red card personnel together with your brush truck so that when they do come, we'd have more likely, more likely to get the red carded personnel as opposed to just a normal structure fire response. So we'll do that kind of coordination amongst ourselves here in King County. Uh, so that we can get the right people there. And then if it does get bigger, uh, it could go to uh, what they call a, a MOB, a state MOB, which a lot of times you'll hear. We've talked about, we've sent our units before to um, the other side of the state or down into California. And that's basically where you're, you're needing more resources from outside the area. That's when it becomes funded by the state. They can provide more resources. Usually you have to go one operational period before that can happen, before it goes state mobilization. They're going to bring in a management teams. It, it just turns into a lot bigger events. Um, the one that happened up in Skycomish that went to a, a state mobilization after the first four hours, I believe. And then that also opens it up to other units to respond as in DNR, uh, US Forest Service, because we do have some of those resources around us. There's the DNR station uh, you know, in North Bend, but those can't go on the initial response unless it's DNR land or if it's part of the state mode. What's DNR again? Uh, Department of Natural Resources. Right. So that's just kind of a, a quick kind of rundown about what we would get if we do have a response here in Snoqualmie. Again, it just kind of the more the bigger it gets, the more resources where we can get, and they're pretty quick. You know, King County is is pretty good in regards to keeping an eye on what resources are going where. But it is kind of a coordination as the the summer progresses and the wildlife season progresses. We have to make sure that we don't send all of the resources, all the brush trucks to to Eastern Washington and leave no one home. So that's again where the zone coordinators we work together just to make sure we don't you know deplete King County if we do have our own instance. We don't send everybody out to the the other states or out to Eastern Washington where there's a big fire. Any, any questions on the on the, the initial response or what we would get in regards to the wildfires? That's one Benson. Yeah, yeah um, that was one of the questions that I was having. You know, you mentioned that we don't have a brush truck in Snoqualmie, but you talked about how, uh, you know, what resources are available in all the surrounding towns and that Eastside and Duval are uh, really big players in, in these situations. Do you consider it a problem that we don't have a brush truck or are the local uh fire departments really good at sharing this 
these kinds of resources? I would say yes and yes to that. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a problem that we don't have one, but it is an opportunity for the future. Um, we do want to try and get most of our personnel red carded so that we do have that opportunity. And although we don't have, you know, we're considered in the wildland inner uh, urban interface where we don't have a lot of wildland area, but there is the potential for say burning up the backside of, of Fall City into the ridge. I, I think that's a discussion for later about, you know, resources, but you know, it, pie in the sky, would it be nice if we had an, our, our own brush truck that we could staff with personnel that would be able to get back into those areas um, on the ridge? Yes. Um, you know, I think that would be definitely. Is that, benefit. is that at the pie in the sky level or is that, you know, is it, uh, is it far enough down your list of priorities that. Our priority right now is to replace the one fire engine, but I think that's going to be a discussion further as in resources that as we, you know, build resources for the department, I believe that's going to be coming further from, from chief and myself about that is something we might want to consider because not only is it a, a resource we could use here in the city, but when you do send a, a, for example, if you had a brush rig that you sent out on some of these fires over to Eastern Washington, if it's available, there is money that comes back to the city from that to rent that vehicle out, which some departments have used to pay for the vehicles in the, in the future. So it is, uh, you know, it's not that you're just, you know, it's not like automatic aid and you're sending it out, there is money come back. We've used it in the past. We sent our fire engine, our backup engine down to California. And I believe we received four, how much? $26,000 while it was down there for the rent, uh, the rental basically of the, of the unit. So that is something that could be. Utilized. How much of that 26 goes back into repairing it from, from use from that? I don't, from what I remember, I don't believe there was any repairs. I mean, wear and tear on the vehicle, but I don't believe there was any specific repairs that were needed to be done to the vehicle, to, to the engine. And it went down as structural protection. It wasn't necessarily in, in the brush or that it was basically protecting houses some of the large wildfires they had down in california they were doing structural protection um so they were you know firefighters with their engines just on the street trying to lay down hose and, and keep it from burning into the neighborhoods so it is an opportunity you know to answer your question is an opportunity for the future for something for us to look at uh for having our own brush vehicle one to help cover those areas around Snoqualmie, especially if some of the other rigs in the region are out, that's just one more rig that can be kept either back or, you know, so it can help balance those zone resources. So, you know, maybe if we have 10 resources in the zone, five of them go out, five can stay here. So it benefits us as well as the region. And then also it could be, you know, utilized to help pay for itself or the personnel when it goes out on on responses. Well, to that end, does, does the, well, maybe you don't know the answer to this, but I wonder if the county participates in uh, the funding of these things. Sort of if you've got a, if you've got a brush truck and it benefits the county, maybe there are county funds available. I don't available. believe so. Most of the, most of the ones that I've known is, is they're funded by the departments. You know, like I said, Duval is heavily into it. They have two rigs that they send out. They send their tenders out. Uh, Fall City just had their brush truck and their tender just came back from a a seven day deployment, I believe. So it's really on the, the departments themselves to, to handle. There are some, you know, opportunities. DNR sells rigs, you know, they sell rigs at a discount, older brush rigs, they'll sell back to departments at, at a discounted price. So there are some opportunities out there in that regards, but I'm not aware of any, any grants per se, or any help from the county or the state that would help you purchase a vehicle. Uh, just going back to red cards, what exactly is required um, for our remaining folks to get the, the access. red card it's an annual uh it's there's an initial and an annual requirement it has to do with uh there's training as well as a physical portion of it where you every year the firefighters have to uh do a pack test to make sure that they're physically fit to be able to because it is a little bit more strenuous than the typical structure fire so they have to do a, a pack test where they wear a weighted vest or a backpack and i believe it's a two mile I believe it's a two mile they have to do, but it, it's really to get our people initially certified this year. Uh, there was, we only had four, I believe. And then we added a couple this year. They went through, I believe it was a, maybe a 10 hour training online. And then they also did a field day where they went and practiced and then they did their pack test, but I'm not exactly positive as there are specific requirements they have to do, but it, it's not something that's out of line or takes a, like I said, we had a couple that went through this year and I believe you know, maybe took them two or three weeks of working through the stuff. Not, you know, obviously not all the time. Did, are you aware of exactly what the requirement is, Chief, for the red card? 
No, Mike hit it on the head. There's a online in a, in a regular classroom training and then then they have to do annual requirements. The card is good for four years um, and then they have to make annual requirements. It either means going on an incident or doing specific level of training, like deploying their shelter, um, things like that. So we have talked about building a bridge for those members that have not gotten their training um, so that we can be a fully trained department. Mike, Mike talked about this. Our challenge with, if you look at the boundaries of the city of Snoqualmie by law, what our area is defined as is a urban wildland area. Um, we have hydrants throughout our entire city. So um, this, there's laws that stipulate that. So where this becomes effective is us when we're doing mutual aid with each other. Um, if we're responding to a wildland fire outside of the city, we can seamlessly plug ourselves into those incidents. And similarly, Eastside or Fall City can plug themselves into ours. Our challenge is a small organization, and I, we just had this conversation today with the union. We require them to be firefighters. We require them to be EMTs. We require them to be swift water rescue technicians. We require them to be rope rescue technicians. Now we're asking them to do this. And then we're talking about a ladder truck. There's a, they're, they're good generalists, but we can only pile so much onto them before they break. And those are some of the conversations that Mike and I are having right now regarding that. And is there a financial component that's allowed as well to the extent that our folks are seeking additional training in addition to what's already required? Like, do they get a benefit financially from it? There is uh, language in our contract mm -hmm. uh, specific to the red card uh, certification, but we've, there's, I don't think there's an incentive with that. Is that I have to go back and look at that. The, the, they are given, the red card people are given a 1%. Up to four people. Yeah. Right? I can send that, you the exact information. Out, yeah. yeah, I'll send you the exact information. We used to have it out of that. It just recently changed. So let me, let me provide that information. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions or comments? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. The other thing just to add to, we have been working to better equip our firefighters. Uh, we didn't use to carry, we carried wildland hose on the engine. We carried some basic equipment, but now that we're getting more red carded, they, the red carded people re are required to have a pack, which includes their fire shelter, their emergency shelter, some other tools. So we have added that equipment to the engines okay. to make it so that our crews could stay longer than just the initial hour of response so we are working on that way toward our equipment you know as chief said the next step would be to, to get more people red carded okay thank you that was very helpful so just to tag on to that so if we were to have an event and we have all those resources responding the city would actually also mobilize their staff to help support that event okay. especially if it was happening either in or near or around the city um, we would activate the emergency operations center, which is located over at the fire station. Um, we have different staff members that fill different roles in those positions. The council members actually have an active role in that. That is working with the mayor and the city administrator, as well as the city attorney, to actually focus on policy level conversations about how they want to handle things. Um, and they're looking forward into this event and having those conversations about doing certain things like declaring the emergency that the mayor can sign. And then that gives her certain powers to do certain things um, such as call for additional resources that may not be part of the fire department's response, uh, putting up fencing, things like that, shutting down streets. Um, we'd also work with our partners in this with the hospital and the school district and all of those other people to help coordinate a response that would be better for that. Um, the EOC would also work with the county to handle the evacuations. Hopefully we would do a little bit better than they did up in Snohomish County where they actually activated their, they were notifying people of a level three evacuation, which means get out right now. And that whole message went countywide. So they had people in Everett, Linwood, that were also getting this phone call that they need to get out of their house and they don't even smell smoke. So, um, that's why it's important that we exercise, right? We exercise and we practice these things. We've got a meeting coming up where we're gonna be talking with the school district about some sort of event there and trying to work together on that. Similarly, as we go through the rest of this year and before our next season, um, we'll start ramping up that conversation as well to, to do some more EOC exercises. Cause we have a lot of new staff in the city and they're asking questions as well. What is their role in the process? So I know we've got a full agenda but I can take any questions that you guys may have about the emergency management side of it. Um, I, I just have a question then. So going forward from here, what types of conversations do you recommend or do you recommend city council sitting down and going through these are the general things that would happen if we had these types of emergencies? Yeah, no, we can certainly provide more education information to the council so that they're prepared for those conversations. Similarly, there's an ongoing conversation about uh, becoming, uh, having our communities that are, that are better prepared for these types of events. FireWise is a common program. Um, we do have maps that show our wildland urban interface like Mike was 
Chief Bailey was just talking about, mm -hmm. where they've identified high risk areas within our community, we can work within those neighborhoods um, to actually reach out to them and try to bring them together to, to educate them on what they can do regarding creating defensible spaces and setting these things back. Uh, just to be clear, you know, if we were to get a wildfire that would burn up the ridge, the backside of the ridge, like you saw at Bull Creek, mm -hmm. At that point, depending on, and I'm not trying to scare anybody, I just, I would hate to have it happen. And then you come to me and say, what just happened there? It's possible that we will be writing off multiple homes. We will just draw a line in a map and say, this is what we're going to protect. And those maps are based on experience and, and working with trained professionals to come in and support our response to that. Um, as tragic and as crazy as that may sound, that's what we end up having to do to protect the rest of the community. We identify those natural barriers like streets and things like that. And we may have to write off certain neighborhoods or maybe write off two or three homes within that neighborhood because of the time associated with getting those resources up here. So just to be transparent. So if we were to ever be in that position and having those conversations is really what helps us have those resilience conversations with the community about how you need to help us also protect the neighborhood. And the way you do that is by having defensible spaces and working with the with the golf course to make sure that they've got their lawns and their, their different parts kept back and pushing back the fireproof uh, work. Phil is an excellent, our, the urban forester is an excellent resource for us. He has experience with firewise and defending, creating defensible spaces and can be a huge asset and is trying to put together a plan with us to help manage some of these things. Okay. So then you've, you've identified throughout Snoqualmie and around Snoqualmie, the places that are at greatest risk already. King County has. King, King County, County has identified a, yes, has identified a wildland or urban interface map that show different areas within the community that are higher risk and greater risk. It's part of the hazard mitigation plan. And, and we're, we actively work to try to create, like what you were saying, defensible spaces in those areas? That is our goal, yeah, and, and, and apply for hazard mitigation grant funds that we could potentially apply to those types of programs. Okay. Yeah. They just recently came out with the map, so it's <laughs> it's it's hot off the press, if you will. So, because we'll want to give you all the questions. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? All right. So moving on now, we have mutual and automatic aid, which is also fire. Sure. Yep. I put together a quick memo. I just put just some numbers on some paper just to give you guys a sense, and I've asked IT also to. Uh, roll them also asked IT to, oh, I asked IT to uh, put together a map, which I'll share probably in a couple of weeks when I get my hands on it. We got this data and information from our dispatch center, uh, NORCOM, they provided it for us. And, and this is just two ways of measuring mutual aid. And I just wanted to share this because I started this conversation with you, uh, with the committee a couple of weeks ago. Um, so when there's a couple of, uh, there's actually a handful of different ways that we could look at mutual aid. Um, this sheet here looks at mutual aid in two ways. It looks at incident count and unit count. Um, and incident count is okay. There's a single call and we provide them aid and there's a single call in Snoqualmie and we get aid from outside, right? So that's one way of looking at it. And when we share those numbers in our reports, that's generally the way we look at mutual aid. That's the way a lot of agencies look at it. But as you drill down into it um, and you look at expenses and costs associated with mutual aid, there's probably a couple of different ways you could look at it. You could look at the number of resources we're sending, which is that's what that unit count is, or we could look at the number of people that we're sending. You could even total up all the hours that are associated with mutual aid to see if one agency is, is, is providing another agency uh, a different amount. So now, as you can see from a unit count perspective, uh, Eastside Fire we uh, mutual aid given to, so we gave to, to Eastside Fire 434 incidents, which doesn't include uh, freeway and wilderness, I'm sorry, it does include freeway and wilderness area incidents. And the reason why I put that number out there, those are untaxed areas that we respond to jointly, although Eastside Fire takes credit for them. Um, but the, those agencies do not receive any tax funding for those areas. So I just thought I would throw that number out, out there for you. Um, in fact, Eastside Fire ends up encumbering the costs of those dispatch incidents there because that's how dispatching charges are provided. So that's why we're not advocating to get credit for those. Um, and then similarly, uh, I did not include the medic incidents. I carved those off because those are funded through the county, the paramedic program. So that's not really considered mutual aid. The taxpayers within the community actually fund that program. Um, and then lastly, the casino incidents, we actually 
uh, apply for uh, compact mitigation funds through the casino, um, and we get money from the tribal government for those incidents. So I took those off of the top, the 22. But anyway, if you look at the incident count, uh, there was 434 incidents that we gave, and then we only got 223 incidents back from Eastside Fire. Similarly, Fall City, we gave 61, but um, we received 93 from Fall City. So there's a little bit of an imbalance there. Uh, but when you start looking at those incident counts, the unit counts of how we exchange resources, you'll notice that Eastside Fire, the 434 that we provided them, um, but what we got back from those them in unit count is over 400, actually 400 resources. So when you start adding up those, and when you start looking at those other incidents, and on the back, there's a quick note that talks about um, the, the types of incidents that we responded on throughout the Upper Valley in Snoqualmie Pass, 18 structure fires, 364 EMS incidents, 28 technical rescues, 92, um, 279, only 279 of that 400, um, those 400 incidents uh, required a single unit. So, and one of the things that that map will point to is how many of those are around the city that we're handling as a first response. That's what Council Member Watton was asking about. Mm -hmm. But then it'll also show those other incidents outside of the area where either North Bend is East Side Fire is not available in North Bend. We respond over there, and then similarly they're coming over here to back back us up. So, um, and then the remaining of those 279 between 279 and 400, those are multi-unit responses. So those are the structure fires or the automatic fire alarms. And I talked about that a little bit as well. We get a balance of that now back, now that we are accredited agency, we've evaluated our community, we have a community risk assessment. We have them responding over here to back us up. That's why they're actually, the mutual aid has been balanced compared to the way it used to be. It used to be really out of, when I first got here eight years ago, we were providing like six to one incident count. And I even looked at it from this perspective and it was still out of, out of, out of alignment, um, but now it's gotten much better. So that's why I'm a little bit less concerned about mutual aid. But once I have the additional information, I can certainly answer any questions, but I'll share the maps with you once I have them. Wonderful, thank you. Any questions? That's my one. This is incredibly helpful, especially today as I watch for like the third time this week and they, in the past week, an aid car go by my office, which I know that's mutual aid. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But that's anecdotal. And and I think it's also important to note uh, the, the structure fire that you had it um, in, in the Heights, mm -hmm. where we have one engine there and a lot of other engines there. That's where the balance comes into play. And, and uh, we, we certainly don't have the vehicles to respond to all those incidents so thank you yep, no problem the heat map though i'm waiting for that yeah me too <laughs> me too um yeah we i did one of those quite a few years ago actually for all the different types of incidents that we go on and because it's really telling um especially when you start seeing all the hot spots throughout the ridge area and then downtown and then the fire station plopped right between those two not near either one of them <laughs> So unfortunately this is, this is very good thank you, very you, you no no, no this, this is this is this is very interesting i'm not i i guess my the question that i have is do you feel like it's balanced do you feel like do you feel like overall if you just had to average it out are we getting and giving somewhere in the neighborhood of the same uh, mutual aid. Yeah, based on this information, if I was to dig into it deeper, I am much more comfortable with where it is today than it was six years ago. Um, the reality is that, you know, as you've all been deliberating the CIP and, and all the ER and R and all that other stuff in the budget, those agencies do the same things and they're planning and budgeting for all of those resources as well, right? So them sharing those resources with us is a benefit that we don't have to pay for. That's why it's important when I look at these numbers that there's a readiness component, a readiness cost to this. Um, they're dealing with that. And when you look at this, it's much more, in my opinion, I believe it's much more balanced than it was. Well, do, you, do the other fire chiefs do this to the other? Do, do they have uh, numbers like this where they they compare and no so a lot of agents so when we started that's a great question so yes they will look at numbers of mutual aid incidents and exchanging but as far as having a dialogue we started going down a path of having a conversation with Eastside Fire when it was really far out of whack saying hey look you know the area behind the city 
District 38 used to pay the city to provide protection to that area. They no longer do that. Now we're providing it for free. Is there any way that we can come to some sort of remuneration agreement to provide service to that area? And they didn't want to touch that because of this idea of paying for mutual aid. It should be mutual. It should be exchanged. And if we're not comfortable with it, then they can ex extend their response times or they can add different resources to those calls. And we've had that conversations. They have made adjustments to their incident count or their incident types. But it, seem, it seems like it, this would be a great conversation to get you know, the six or eight local fire chiefs, you know, talking to each other and, and yeah, just we, making sure that it is mutual. Yeah, no, we talk about it, we evaluate and we can we can bring those things up. There are components of the mutual aid agreement that says we won't charge except for fuel and things like that as part of the agreement. Um, there was an automatic aid agreement that's been signed. Automatic aid is basically you agree to whatever you give, you give and whatever you get, you get and there's no other discussion. We purposefully not sign that because of these imbalances that we have dealt with in the past. Um, it's frankly, it's a great conversation to have amongst the elected officials with our neighboring districts as well, especially when these things are imbalanced. But the response you usually get is if it's imbalanced then go ahead and join us it won't be imbalanced anymore become part of east side fire so <laughs> and all restaurants are taco bell and yeah you know, right. yes customer oh sorry there so you did, there is a new chief there as well right <clears throat> yeah so ben lane their assistant fire chief is going to be promoted to fire chief i think i think his official start date is october november yeah, Chief Clark is still there. He's okay. they're doing the cross training and handing a lot of that stuff off. But a lot of that direction comes from their governing board. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. We've raised the conversation before. Yes. <laughs> it creates some tension, to say the least. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Moving on, the next item is the Panorama Apartments calls for service. advises me that it's my turn. <laughs> I was enjoying all the information. I mean, I'm writing down what we can do better based on what you think. So um, a while back, I uh, was asked to collect some data uh, regarding our activity at Panorama Apartments and how it's impacted our, our service. And the information that I have shows that it does, in fact, impact. Uh, and I'll give you some numbers. Uh, in 2020, when Panorama started impacting our level of service. We handled 65 calls for service at that time. Last year was 337. And so far this year, it's 223. Actually, it was as of 8, 26, 2022, it was 223. Compare that to another high density, uh, actually two high density uh, apartment locations, Echo Ridge, uh, 2020 had four. 2021 had two, and 2022 so far this year has five. Significant difference, but there is another one, Pickering Apartments, which is uh, another location where we are stretched thin in our uh, calls for service. 2020, we 324, 2021, 284, and so far this year, 435. A significant increase in Pickering Court. Uh, both Panorama and Pickering uh, have um, caused us uh, a lot of um, stress on our uh, level of service because of the calls, but there's one significant difference between Pickering and Panorama. And Pickering, we have uh, responded to a high level of CIT, mental health, mental crisis type of calls for service at Pickering Court to the amount of, uh, in 2021, 174 and so far this year, 89. Compare that with Panorama, 32 in 2021 and 24 so far this year. So in just that brief uh, data information that I, I threw at you, the type of calls that we're going to Panorama are significant towards the more violent type and more
type of calls that require more than one officer to respond. For instance, in assault calls, although low uh, three this year, disturbance uh, has gone from eight to 14. I was 14 all of last year, or uh, eight all of last year and 14 this year. Domestic violence, uh, 22, and we're gonna equal that this year. We are at 14. Um, and then suspicious, uh, 18 all of last year and it's increased to 26. Doesn't seem like much uh, number, but when you accumulate all those and the type of crimes you're going to, like I said, that's an impact of two officers. If we're going out with only three officers, that tells you that we only have one officer based uh, out there patrolling while these other two officers are occupied handling calls for service at either Panorama or Pickering Court. Um, this is not unusual at high density apartment locations. Um, that is normal. Uh, and what we're trying to do is uh, increase our proactive activity at Panorama specifically uh, to try and help us deal with the increased calls for service at those locations. And that's developing the relationships, whether it be COPS programs, involving ourselves in, uh, in, in meetings with the uh, on-site management who have been very cooperative and help us in every way they can. Sometimes they're not able to help um, based on their inability to have change, it takes higher up uh, from different headquarter locations to make those changes. Uh, but they've allowed us to look at uh, video camera systems when we have issues there, they're working with us to try and curb that. This is not including all of the calls for service on Frontier associated with the parking issues that we have there. That is significant. Our police support officer spends a tremendous amount of time dealing with the parking at that location. We probably receive, and we have received over the last two years, and I know the fire chief is very, very familiar with this because he worked um, very hard on trying to figure out a way to, to, to help find a solution, and we haven't been able to, but they parked a lot of the cars on Frontier uh, instead of in the parking lot uh, where we would hope they would. And so those calls for service are significant. They are not included in this number. Um, that's the data that I have for Panorama. It does give you a little bit of an idea how much it impacts our level of service um, along with Pickering Court. Uh, and we are actively trying to figure out how we can find a solution about uh, slowing that number down. That's number one. So Chief Phipps, this is incredibly important information. A um, couple things. One is where is Pickering Court? Is that the down? Yes, it's off. It's by the school. If you go by the where the bus uh, barn is, if you will, the school district, if you go the first right, it's in that area. Okay. It's a Pickering Court. It's on Pickering Court. And, and the second it's, question. It's an apartment complex with probably about 30, maybe the fire chief, about 36 apartments. Maybe it's significantly smaller than Panorama. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> so the second question is, the activities that require police responses tend to be more after 10 p.m., or is that a misnomer? I would have to go through, well, I, I, or we can I would have to go through dive. the data that I have, and I can surely get that. I don't know. I think it's throughout the day. Throughout the day. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Benson. And how many units are at Panorama? We tried, yeah, I think it's 190. I was told 194 today. But 194 units. So, so Pickering, Pickering Court has 36 apartments and they've had 435 calls this year. Yeah. That's an, that's an, that's, that's an, well, my, I'm not good at math, but that's like what, 14 calls per unit? Yeah, that's including quite a few. I'm sure the fire department has responded there a significant amount of times as well with medical and that's you're, including you, but you're just talking about your calls yeah well we respond uh, often on medical type calls okay. too all right all right so so some of those overlap but still that's that's it is significant yes wow chief would there be anything that you can see or things that we need to take into consideration. I mean, obviously size doesn't always matter. That's true. Um, some of it is just management at the location. 
Some of it is, is the requirements to get into uh, housing at those locations. Um, and I know that Pickering has uh, people in there that are uh, in need of some medical issues often, uh, assistance often. Uh, and just based on the CIT type calls at that location, obviously there's some mental health issues there. Um, and that's difficult to, to find a solution for that. Is there anything that we can do in our role as council to help at this point or is it more just investigating and figuring out what, what would be helpful? Well, you know, one of the best things and, and we're working on it is to get fully staffed. You know, when you're going out with three people, you can't address some of these issues as well as you, sh you would like to. You can't be as proactive as we'd like to. Uh, these kind of issues need proactive, they need visibility, they need drive throughs the parking lot as often as possible, build relationships with the people that are in those uh, apartment complexes. That's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. If you're not fully staffed, it's very difficult to do that. Okay, understandable. Is there, I'm sorry, no. I was just gonna ask if, is there a role that we've been considering we've been the city and the police department, um, having the mental health person go down there and, and be proactive in, in her role? As you know, we are developing that program and uh, she is high energy and I have no doubt that that's gonna be a big part of her, her job. And it is uh, part of her, her um, focus is to identify where she's really needed. And just based on this, I think we found uh, an area where she might be needed. Fantastic, thank you. Councilmember Watton. So, I understand who manages Panorama and and that they have a lot of experience in dealing with properties all around. Um, Pickering Court, I'm not familiar with management team, so that'd be kind of an interesting kind of yeah, side. I don't believe they have management on site like Panorama does. Uh, Panorama has an office in, on site. Don't believe that Pickering Court does. Okay, very well. Thank you. I, I, I don't believe they have management. I mean, I, you know, it's the, the Pickering court so far this year has, has received a dozen calls per unit so far. They'll, they'll hit 18 calls per, per apartment, uh, apartment unit at Pickering court this year. Um, Panorama, I'm, I mean, if I, if I didn't know about the Pickering court, Panorama is going to have more than one and a half calls per unit um but i mean uh shoot you want a hot spot map you there's there's like one spot <laughs> you know this, this is this is that's that's an insane amount of uh resources going to a, a very localized spot very true you're spot on um and and that's what i was talking about building those relationships there are some uh, locations, apartments at that location where we are there multiple times in, in one day, sometimes. So. Any other comments? Other than this was very helpful to know. It's a bit of an eye opener. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, in that case, I guess we'll move forward. And oh, oh, can, I, can I just say one, one more thing? Do we know who manages Echo Ridge? <laughs> yeah. Okay, can we get them to buy Pickering? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little Pickering. I know that, but I, I did more. <laughs> Interestingly, I just looked up the website and it appears that the wait list to get into Pickering is actually quite long. It's a number of people. To where? into Pickering. It yeah. is. It's a select um, group for housing uh, people uh, in need of certain, they have to meet certain requirements. And that's why those calls for service are up here. So it's very close. I mean, I, uh, I can't, I can't imagine trying to get in there. The, the desperation that you would have to have to, to live in that kind of place is terrifying. Um, I will tell you, there's good people. I, uh, I mentor a young boy who's 13 years old that lives there. I pick him up quite often uh, and take him we do mentoring things and uh, he's a great, great kid. Uh, and there's great people that live in that uh, apartment complex. There's some that are just in need of a lot of services and they make a huge impact on our services. 
Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the dialogue and to the extent that there's things that we can do to help. Please thank reach you. out. Um, anything further? In that case, we can move forward to um, item number five, which is uh, the fleet. And I had asked for additional information so that we know um, basically how how the vehicles are in our current police fleet so that we know where to move from here. Yes, I just, uh, like Chair Christensen said, uh, asked me for some basically raw data regarding how many vehicles we had, mileage on those vehicles, year of the vehicles. And this is raw data reflecting that current data. Uh, as you can see, uh, four of the vehicles are North Bend um, vehicles. The rest are all Snoqualmie uh, vehicles. And you can see that uh, we have one 2013 vehicle. That is a vehicle I drive, which I do like. I have no problem with it at all. Um, I'm just an old school guy, I guess. Uh, we have one 2015, one 2016, uh, two 2017s, one 2018, and five 2020s and six 2022s. And I say that because you can tell that a lot of our vehicles are new. We typically uh, do five year, 100 to 120,000 is usually the life of a police vehicle. Uh, we have two that are pushing that. One of them is 120,000 miles right now, and the other one is uh, at 100,000. So there's two vehicles that are really uh, pushing that envelope right now as far as the mileage goes. Obviously, the year, there's there's uh, three that are pushing that, uh, and then two additional that are probably on the, the line. Uh, but most of our, our fleet is a newer vehicles. We have 11 since 2020, uh, have low mileage below 50,000. So we're in a good place right now, um, but it's also a great time to, to take a look at that take home car program as we've been talking about, uh, because we do have vehicles that are already in the fleet that uh, will be in the fleet for longer time, we would hope if we went to that process. Just was hoping it wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> So. All right. Uh, well, thank you for the information. Are there any questions? Hopefully that oh. helps you out uh, in your mm -hmm. discussions regarding take home car. Yeah, that, that's still in uh, F and A. Yeah. Okay. Right. I, I believe it will be coming budget. through in the budget. Yeah. What's that? I believe it'll be it is coming through in the budget. It's in the mayor's budget. Okay. Right. All right. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, all right, so it appears that we finished our discussion items. Are there any matters of new business that um, council members or anyone else would like to add for future discussions? I'm afraid to raise any. <laughs> I can only think of one thing now. I mean, geez. <laughs> you guys are killing it. I, I, I love the work that you do. And um, I'll tell you what, man, thanks for keeping us safe because uh, you get a big old job. All you. Absolutely. You do tremendous work. Chief yeah, I just have one thing. I, I, I hate to spring things on people or surprise things on people. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on uh, this Monday or at the next council meeting, we're going to be uh, saying farewell to a handful of our members within the department as well as all well, three. Um, and then also saying hello to our new members of our volunteers. We have five new volunteers that we're bringing on, but we're also um, over the last couple of months, we've lost three members. One is Tom Monroe. He is retiring for a second time. Um, he retired pre-COVID, came back part-time as a retiree, and now is officially hanging up his uh, administrative fire coat. Um, and then we also had... Wait, uh, and when are we expecting him back? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to hang on to him through October, but he doesn't even want to stay for that. So, um, and then we have two other members that were hired about six, actually about eight years ago when I first started. Actually, they were the first two members that I hired. Uh, they've taken lateral positions to the city of Redmond. So Mike Stevens and Lucas Hughes um, are leaving. They left the organization at the beginning of the month. We have conditional offers out to two new firefighters, which we'll introduce next month, um, as well as Tom's replacement just signed the agreement, the offer of employment today that will also have her come in and we'll introduce her. Uh, but with that change, with those senior members leaving, it's really pushed us to go back and reevaluate some of the decisions that we've made over the last six months. One of them being um, we've moved Captain Fouts downstairs um, as our training captain. Um, and our thought was, because we were part of this training consortium down south, was to go back and reevaluate this idea of a training consortium in two or three or four years from now. 
but with losing two senior members who were very integral to our swift water and technical rescue programs, we've gone back and reviewed that and we may be coming forward or at least coming forward with a discussion on whether or not it makes sense to join the training consortium in the north on January 1st and then potentially sign our, assign our captain to that training consortium so that he can represent the city, keep an eye on what's going on. And then also we wouldn't have to write a check because his time associated with that. So I just want to give you a heads up on that, that we're going to be coming forward with it um, as a discussion item, probably at the next uh, public safety committee meeting, um, give you kind of a better understanding of what we're trying to do and why we are kind of changing course um, from where we were originally. Our plan is to still bring Jake downstairs, but, um, this the leaving those two members leaving us uh, has really been a gut punch to the organization as well as us having to go back and reevaluate what we're doing um, and we're putting together plans to replace future members if we lose anybody else but i just want to give you a heads up on those things that are going to be coming down okay thank you very much. okay so those uh, guys that we lost laterally it wasn't to a take-home fire truck program or something like that was okay. no i i remind them twice and i'll probably I'll probably say this in front of the council that they've gone to a lesser fire department and they're going to realize they've made a huge mistake in about <laughs> six or seven months from now um, as they're transporting ambulance calls. And Redmond has a, they do a lot. One of the nice parts about working up here is you go on a diverse type of calls. One minute you could be up in the mountains, you know, doing a trail rescue. Next minute you're on a critical incident out on the freeway, extricating victims, uh, and then a structure fire 20 minutes later. And yeah, who wants to miss that? Yeah, right. Downtown Redmond, you may not get that type of call. Well, I'm just saying. So. Um, anyway, I just want to give you guys a heads up on that. So you Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything further? Uh, had a new employee, new officer start today, uh, entry level. So uh, see, this is the kind of news that you're supposed to bring to us. Are you paying attention, Chief? Oh, don't. <laughs> Uh, I can't. We got now I got. Still. Now I got yeah. <laughs> Don't give them any opportunity. <laughs> um, and then uh, we do have three uh, people in the academy graduating uh, one and two, or two, two weeks from now, and one three weeks from now. So we have three more coming on board after the police academy. And so they'll be uh, in our field training program on the streets, hopefully in 18 weeks from that point. And so that is a great thing. Maybe we can stop uh, doing mandatory overtimes on our officers that are currently out there right now and give them some kind of a break. So four, one today started and three coming out. It's a great thing. It's fantastic great news. news. That is great news. Thank you. All right. Looks like there is nothing further to add unless um, city administrators or anything you wanted to add? No? Okay, wonderful. In that case, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. I will second that motion. Thank you. We can, we can cut. We are adjourned. Yep.